or two days off a week yeah or something but like literally just whether it's running walking whether it's skateboarding or it's like literally whatever you do but as long as you sweat or exert your body in some way i don't know man because like early fucking primitive humans were runners Mm. they would run for miles and miles like chasing fucking prey and shit like in packs like endurance through the motherfucking roof you know what i mean and like just because we live in a world where we can push a button and a car comes and picks us up or we can just order food directly to our bedrooms like and we have the internet that doesn't mean that we're not those same creatures that like killed mammoths with spears true like physically we are those same people so like can you imagine if you took a caveman from like 1 bc and like like made them live the lifestyle that we do Hmm. the caveman would probably be all fucked up (laughs) for probably (laughs) a lot of reasons yeah (laughs) probably would ruin the dude's life (laughs) you know he wouldn't i don't know man like do you know what i'm saying like you gotta like we literally are we obviously some people have physical uh limitations like for any for a, a multitude of reasons that maybe means they can't like go hard or whatever or like I don't know, whatever. Like, there's a lot of a lot of variables, and I understand that. But I think as long as like you're literally physically moving your body at like at any any kind of consistency, whether it's walking or it's fucking yoga, or if it's like, mm. I literally have no idea. I don't know. Even if you just did like a bunch of jumping jacks yeah. every day, I mean that would be miserable because it would be boring as fuck. But like, ideally, the exercise you get would also be intellectually engaging in some way. And by that, I mean your ideal exercise that you're doing all the time. I believe you're only going to do it if you like it. Like if you played basketball all through high school and you haven't played in 10 years as an adult, you should start playing fucking basketball. Yeah. Like if, cause you fucking like it, don't force yourself to do yoga and be vegan just because you saw that online, just because it's good for other people doesn't mean it's good for you. That's true. You know what I mean? Like, you got to return to what... Even... I don't know, man. Like, maybe the only exercise you got when you were a kid was playing capture the flag with your neighbors. Like, try to create that same spirit somewhere in your life. Yeah. You know what I mean? I don't know. (laughs) Well, I keep thinking, for myself, I'm not a super athletic person. uh I like to do athletic things sometimes, but it's more of a for fun thing. Sure. Like, when I'm super stressed out, maybe this is just part of my, like mental health patterns anyway but i come up in this thing where i'm like going and going and going and going and working myself really hard and maybe being more athletic and being more physically active when i'm actively engaging and burning myself out like i'll work for two weeks in a row with like one day off for no reason really other than kind of a sense of duty and then i'll be miserable and i'll want to die and i'll just be really i'll just basically have a mental health break and want to just sleep which isn't great And what I found is kind of a similar thing, but what helps me, definitely moving, but it doesn't have to be something as vigorous as even working out or something. It could just be like what I always do when I'm really, really, really at the wire, when I just cannot function, I'd have to do something or else I'll fall asleep is sometimes take a nap. Honestly, that does help as long as you keep a timer on it and like don't sleep all day and feel Mm. bad about it at the end. But, um, barring that cleaning my room, um, walking around my house, spending time with my cat. I found it's really helpful for me when I'm in really bad bouts of depression because I have depression and PTSD. Um, Both of those things tend to come with dissociative states, which are really counterintuitive for art making and for writing and things like that because it's just not, I'm not present in my body, if that makes sense, which I think is something probably a lot of people are experiencing right now with quarantine too. Um, But I found that curating my space in a way that brings me into the moment, like lighting a candle or burning incense or doing something that makes the room smell a certain way or playing with my cat or making my bed or doing things that are tactile that I'm touching and interacting with my surroundings, even working like on a clay sculpture, if maybe I'm normally a painter, something like that, like just bringing myself into the moment and kind of grounding myself and taking my time is really helpful and important this is kind of different but something that helped me in the past i haven't been able to do it um during covid because of my household social distancing um agreement for my pod but um what i have done and what i would love to go back to doing very soon is volunteering as a pal at horizons for homeless children 
which that's their place-based activity leader program. And essentially you go to, um, there's a network of homeless shelters that work with Horizons, but they're women and children shelters and you'll go there and you do a certain amount of training so that you're okay to be around the kids. And then they have a little playroom in the shelter that the kids can only play in when they're being supervised because of, um, child services and stuff. Like in case there was an injury, like you need someone on staff to be monitoring what they're doing. So you would be one of those people, but what you do is you go in and you just play with the kids. You're not disciplinary. You don't do anything like punitive. If they like hit another child or something like that, you just call their parents, but it gives the parents a break and it gives you time to just honestly play. And I've been trying to channel the spirit of that where I haven't been able to actually do it with real kids because I think it was beneficial for me and my mental health as much as it was for them in the sense that I was giving myself a justifiable reason to just sit down and play or sit down and like, yeah, like playing with Play-Doh, painting a picture, like the stuff that you feel stupid doing as an adult by yourself. But it's okay to do that stuff. And I highly encourage it. And that's how I've been getting through lockdown. Because another thing too, is a lot of us became artists as kids and as teenagers Mm -hmm. and and decided to stay artists as adults. But when you're a kid, your responsibilities are school and your family and whatever. So because you that is like the focal point of your life, art is your outlet. Yeah. And that's like what you get to do to decompress. But if you become an adult and you get independent and you decide to make art your main thing, that's not your outlet anymore. That's your focal point. That's your main that's your main thing. Hmm. So, if art is your main thing, how the fuck's it going to be your outlet too? Well, that's why you it's important. Fucking crazy. It can be though, you I fuck think. Fuck yourself up. <laughs> like, it's important to have boundaries with your projects. You can have though. you can have creative outlets, but if you can you can't take a break from painting by painting. I don't know if I agree. Really? Yeah, cuz I think it depends why you're painting. Like for me, I'll have like a bunch of commissions and I'll be working on them yeah. for hours and then I'll just get sad and I'll start just art journaling. I guess I'm on the other side of that though cuz I don't do a lot of commissions. Most of what I do is art for art's sake. Oh, fair. That so makes if sense. So you can't take a break for I I get to a point where I'm taking a break like from from art for art's sake. That makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> You know, too much of anything is bad. Too much of a good thing is too much. That's yeah. what my mom used to say to me. Fair. She literally used to say that all the time. It was funny. <laughs> um, anyway. But yeah, no. As far as outlets go, it doesn't have to be a real thing. It doesn't have to be serious. Like, we just bought Razor scooters. <laughs> and that's been really cool. We've been we've been Razor scootering in the streets. Yeah. Downtown Boston. Jumping off of ledges. Yeah, jumping downstairs. Fun. Doing backflips. <laughs> We'll post Brian's wipeout video on the channel soon. Yeah, yeah, we will. I fucking fucked myself on a scooter. It was lit. Anyway, whatever. It was really scary. I thought they were going to die. But yeah, no, man. <laughs> fucking fuck. 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 I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Good talk. Bottom line, be kind to yourself. Don't be judgmental of your ways of decompressing. Find out what works for you. Um, and really th- listen to your body and your brain. And think critically about what it means to 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 like to take a break Mm -hmm. i don't know man you know what someone told me one time that i thought was interesting this person was telling me this was someone who was trying to convince me to do yoga and why yoga is a better meditation than regular meditation Mm -hmm. and she was just like when you meditate you're just fucking laying there so you're getting bored and it sucks but if you do yoga you're actually doing something and i was like wow you're right. My meditation of just planking basically on a mattress sucks. <laughs> like it's horrible. It's a shitty way to meditate. And it's why why I don't do it. <laughs> so if I find a more active and interesting way to meditate, I'll actually like to meditate. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's interesting because it's similar to what we were talking about with the podcast that we were sitting here focusing so hard on trying to have a good podcast and sitting in good, our little chairs thing. and with our teacups, like researching people, which is good. And that is what we want to do. But we can still make good content if we're just honest about what's going on and just kind of lower that bar. Yeah. Or do something else at the same time as we're talking. Yeah. We're the Boston Art Podcast. We are trying to be. <laughs> we are the arbiters of what is and isn't art in the city of Boston. By the way, some, this is totally a subject change, but I've been getting so many questions about that name, and I think it's so funny. Do we want to talk about that? Yeah, go off. <laughs> um, we chose the name Boston Art Podcast. Basically, I think we talked in the beginning of this in our introductory episode about the Project Sliving that we did, where basically our thesis of the project was what makes us different than 
historical artists and artists that are famous and wealthy and basically it was their marketing and exposure was what we concluded and also the mythology wrapped around their personhood by museums and galleries to sell tickets to see their work that's a whole other topic but essentially it is the branding and when we found out that there isn't currently a boston art podcast we thought that that was a void that should be filled and we are artists that are in boston and our well, posit yeah, and is also- that our views are just as valid as anybody else's that lives here and also, we want to shed light on people that we think are cool and great. So that's another way that we can do that with this platform. But, yeah. True. Yeah. But I mean, I feel like that sounds like a statement of hubris, hubris, hubris. But it's not because I think the same thing goes for any of the people that are listening to this right now. Like You are just as valid as anybody else. And your views are important. Yeah. Your views thanks <laughs> yep sick <laughs> nah yeah huh. i don't know man this has been an interesting journey into being more vulnerable though i i just really i really like the idea of being vulnerable on purpose publicly mm-hmm. because i used to do that but the thing was i had no idea what the meaning of that was and like some backstory, I guess. But when I was in high school, I went to an alternative school for kids with addiction issues called Independence Academy. And this wasn't anyone's fault, but they were trying to get the word out about the school so they could get more students to go there because there was only like 10 of us. And they had a capacity of like 50 or 60 students. So they're trying to enroll people. So they started essentially advertising and they would have uh, the students talk to other schools or like you ever been you know you remember in high school when you're in the gymnasium and they pile all the kids in and they have some sad old guy talk to the whole building about addiction and why you shouldn't drunk drive they're basically having us do that so the school was asking me like bringing me and my classmates to schools to programs like having me tell my story talk about addiction my trauma all these things i went through i was speaking to other kids i was speaking to adults i went to an event at the state house one time i was talking to newspapers and they were literally almost taking us on like publicity tours Hmm. for us and i was talking about my trauma and my addictions and all these things i went through went went through at 16 to hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and crowds of, of people and adults that I will n- would never see again. What was that like for you at the time? That's exactly what I'm trying to say is I had no idea what it was like for me. I wasn't thinking about it. I didn't even care. I was like, yeah, this is sick. But like, I didn't understand. Like when you post something online, there's this illusion that if 10 people like it, you think 10 people saw it. But that's not true. A lot more people saw it and didn't interact with it. The cop, you know, the idea of ghost followers. Mm-hmm. People think that a ghost follower is somebody that doesn't see your posts. A ghost follower is somebody who sees your posts but doesn't interact with them because they don't want you to know that they're seeing them. It's kind of like that. Where I got to a point where everybody I met knew what I had been through, addiction and trauma wise. Mm. And by the time I got older and I was an adult, I started to realize like this actually is kind of fucking me up. This is a little bit weird that there are random people in my life that know my story in an intimate way when I never told them personally. Mm. Yeah. Like, that's fucked up. So, but I kind of overcorrected that and I kind of went through some other shit that led me to just kind of clam up and not ever be vulnerable publicly. Or it led me to be way less vulnerable with my art or with music or with writing or with social media. And I think right now I just... The past year, I've just been like, fuck it. Who fucking cares? Yeah. Fuck that shit. I want to, I want to be vulnerable because like nobody likes robot two dimensional people anyway. Yeah. So I just want to be, I want to be real. And like, I think to do that, it's to tell my story, but I think I was kind of ended up in some bizarre situations as a kid that made me not, not vulnerable anymore. It was like, (laughs) I didn't, it was like, I didn't understand I didn't understand how big of a deal it was to tell something to a newspaper. Mm. I didn't know that. I thought that newspapers, because I was 16, were just irrelevant old people things that nobody read. (laughs) I just really didn't. You know what I mean? I just didn't get it. Yeah. So. Well, it's okay. I had no concept of like, those articles about the school and shit that I'm in are still are online. Yeah. They're like still up. Yeah. That was in 2012. 
Yeah. Like that's like pretty, that's like, I like, I don't know, whatever. But yeah, so that's why I wanted.